there are companies which have amazing competency with, maybe with one specific area one specific component and because there was a lack of market for maybe that specific component they've gone ahead and built an entire solution or a vehicle around it which may be suboptimal because you know a lot of that expertise to build a vehicle end to end does not lie in house so i i really feel that collaboration is key Hello and welcome to the Startup Operator podcast. I'm Roshan Karyafa. The EV or the extended clean mobility space is really interesting. A lot of entrepreneurs are building solutions in that domain. And uh, in this conversation I speak with uh, Shreyas Shibulal who's the founder of Misilio about what it will take to develop this ecosystem, some of the emerging use cases and what the future of mobility will look like. This was an interesting conversation, plenty of nuances uh, that we uncovered on the domain itself. I hope you like it. So Let's uh, get into this podcast with Shreyas Shubulal. Hey Shreyas, welcome to the Startup Popular podcast. Thank you so much for making the time. Hey Roshan, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So, I've been really excited to have this conversation. I think you have a very ambitious aim with Misselio to help make the change to clean mobility and maybe we could start there, right? So, could you explain what it entails to make that change? So, I think there are many stakeholders, right, uh, when it comes to making the change to clean mobility and making that transition to in the short term is battery electric, right? And the stakeholders are, you know, namely the government, um there are obviously consumers, there's industry, and industry includes OEMs as well as uh, you know, your tier 1 suppliers of components. And I think uh, you know, if you look at the Indian context, the government has been quite proactive. The startup ecosystem has also kind of flourished in the last couple of years. the amount of capital that's gone into this space is exponential right year on year it's increased so much and i think you know ultimately what is going to requires is is innovation uh, which is ultimately going to lead to a no compromise solution for for consumers and i think that's going to be very key in making this tr- uh, transition which is the end user should not experience well should experience less compromise right and i think that is going to be the trick to actually to see long term adoption right So I want to delve a little deeper into that right so let's talk about the consumer aspect first and maybe talk about the government policy initiatives and and the existing conventional automobile industry's response to this right so so on the consumer side right when will we reach that inflection point or rather what will it take for us to reach that point where consumers say hey you know what i mean electric is a no brainer at this point of time So I think largely it will depend on the the vehicle segment that you're looking at. Majority of the vehicles on the road in India today are two and three wheelers. It's seventy percent of the vehicles on the road. It's a very large segment on its own. And I think even right now, uh, especially with the help of you know fame subsidy and other you know government uh, led initiatives, I think uh, it is starting to make a lot of sense for the consumer to adopt at least in the two and three wheeler context because most of those uh, you know, the the use case itself kind of works. well in the boundaries or in the uh, let's say the limitations of the technology that we have today which mostly translates into into range so i think definitely in the 2 and 3 wheel it's starting to make a lot more sense yes the you know the co- the upfront cost is still high but that is you know some sub- various subsidies are are kind of helping out with that for the other form factors for example the four wheel form factor and also larger commercial vehicle form factors such as lorries and buses i think at least you know for the first mile logistics you know your your trucks i think um it's still a ways off uh, and i think potentially you'll see other kinds of techno- drive trade technologies come in there as opposed to battery electric probably something like a hydrogen fuel cell probably makes a lot more sense for metropolitan buses i think there's already a lot of states in india which have adopted that in a large way for consumer four wheelers i still think the upfront cost factor is, is still quite high and i think honestly with the vehicles that are in the market today and for the use case that people are looking for there's still a lot of compromises to be made from the consumer perspective yeah I think the fame to subsidies are a start but by no means the solution for this right I mean because with the fame to subsidies you probably get 15% or 20% cheaper but then there are the concerns for range and you know charging stations and really no one has seen like a full cycle maintenance and repair of an electric vehicle right i think those right. skepticisms still remain so you know we mentioned government and policy right i mean the fame to subsidies are there then i think there's a pli that's been announced as well right what is uh, do you think that the government uh, can do from their front uh, to improve adoption 
So I think at this point it's mostly going to be uh, because you know on the demand side they've already done a lot. Fame to um, you know PLI those are all great examples, right? On the supply side, you know encouraging innovation is also something that they've started doing, and I think we will see the effects of that in the long run. It's hard to say exactly to point point and exactly say what uh, what they should do because I think there are so many different comp you know components to the supply side kind of ecosystem, right? And each each one of those things requires a different approach. But I think at the end of the day, it's it's going to come down to encouraging local innovation to solve the problems that we have uh, in India. An example of that is, you know, is uh, exploring alternate cell chemistries. Is, I mean, lithium ion today is the most predominant cell chemistry that's being used uh, in the context of electric vehicles. Is that something that we should invest in more? Or should we be looking at other um, cell chemistries or other modes of clean propulsion, right? I mean, hydrogen fuel cell is also a good example of that. This is one example, but I think each part of the, the EV value chain will need a separate kind of, let's say, policy agenda. Right. And we look at the automobile industry, right? I mean, it's the classic innovator's dilemma, right? Everyone's kind of playing the wait and watch game right now. But although, I mean, everyone from Hero to TVS to Bajaj have all made investments in electric, right? So they're either investing in startups or they've started building their own uh, queues as or well. Both. Or both. Or both, yeah, exactly, or both, right? So, so yeah, I mean, they're, they're starting to take this a lot more seriously, right? So do you expect that, you know, they will... Uh, again, capture this market, or do you think that you know it's their pie that is being eaten by uh, the the startups and so on? I think the automotive kind of industry is going through a huge transformation, right? Uh, the established pair, the established players have tremendous amount of staying power, and you know people say that you know a lot of the components and the kind of expertise that you have around ICE is maybe less relevant in the EV context, which is to some extent true, but. To a great degree, not really, because you know, you know, some of your your basic kind of mechanical skill sets and your mechanical those capabilities do do remain the same, right? What is changing is that you know you you have a lot fewer components. The you know it's become a lot simpler. The 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 powertrain has has changed completely, and that will take time to actually build out that that local ecosystem of components. And I think as far as uh, your, your question about, you know, are are the established OEMs going to kind of dominate the market? Or I guess your question is also kind of, do startups have a chance, right? And I think with the amount of capital that's going into the space, I think, I think yes, definitely there is a good chance, especially in the smaller form factors. I feel that's where the best shot that a startup uh, and you know there there are examples of that already, right? I think there's this huge buzz around uh, multiple startups have introduced uh, two and three wheelers, and sales are happening, right? Uh, I think the bottleneck today is not even capital for this space. I think it's it's supply chain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, also the fact that you know you have to build this in a full stack manner, right? I mean the the cost of innovation is so high at this point of time, right? We're still very early in the in, in the curve, and so people really have to build everything from scratch. So talk to us about the EV ecosystem in India, right? I mean, you're an insider, you've spent, uh, you know, more than a couple of years in this industry. What does the EV uh, ecosystem in India look like? So I think th there are so many different parts of the ecosystem, right? And I think initially it was people who just wanted to sell electric vehicles. And what that meant was, you know, buying CKDs, assembling them and putting them out. Those players are still there today. Then the innovation grew, right? A lot of the, the newer players are actually trying to bring, especially those powertrain components, they're bringing it in-house. And now you have people who are, who are more or less independent and are kind of trying to become suppliers for these, for these independent components, right? Um, and if you, if you look at the components, um, at least, at least, you know, in data from a year ago suggested there are a lot of people in, uh, the battery space, right? Motor manufacture, uh, manufacturing is still in, in its infancy. And in the battery manufacturing space, I'm talking about the battery pack itself, because cell manufacturing in India has not happened in a, in a significant way. And I think to some degree, it's a good thing, because I think we should take our time to identify the cell chemistry that we should invest in as a country. So I think it, it is evolving. And then, you, you know, you also have, have people who are a little bit more on the infrastructure chi side, the charging, especially charging infrastructure, right? And a lot of those companies, especially with with regard to charging infrastructure, I think it's it it is a much more fundamental problem than just kind of putting out charging stations. I think the Indian power grid itself uh, needs significant revamping, and I think 
the, the government is very well, well aware of that and I think there are steps being taken to address that. So I would say, at least from my perspective, the growth of this ecosystem is exponential. Like I, I, can't, I can't describe it any other way, both in terms of scale, amount of capital that's going in and to some degree adoption as well. Right. So with that uh, very useful background, let's uh, get to Missilio, right, which is your startup. And uh, it's structured in a very interesting way, right? I mean, you have a fund, you have a design studio, and then you have uh, plenty of other things. So what was the thought process in terms of putting this together? So I think this was in, you know, late 2018. I think we, uh, you know, I, I kind of narrowed down that I wanted to do something in the electric vehicle space. And I definitely took my time to figure out what, uh, what that was. And I think at the time, you know, I thought there are so many different kind of and, and that's kind of when i identify there's so many different parts to this, to this ecosystem right and where do you play because i still believe today that the road to success in you know for the indian ev ecosystem is going to be more about collaboration because you have pockets of expertise which are kind of dispersed and i think it's going to be a lot more about what's like coming together right and you asked the question about, you know, are the OEMs going to dominate the space or do startups have a shot? And I think if they come together, they have, they have a much better shot. So I, I think instead of going right into a product, you know, developing a, a product, which is either a complete, uh, you know, vehicle or looking at some specific components, I think I decided to take a step back and look at the ecosystem as a whole and see what I can do there, right? So the first, the initiative, as you mentioned, was a fund, which is an early stage, which is an early stage fund for startups in the electric vehicle space in India. Uh, and along with that, I also introduced the Missile Discovery Studio. You know, it's a, it's a product development facility to help electric vehicle startups go from ideation to prototype. And I think the, the intention behind starting the Discovery Studio was to lower the barrier of entry uh, to actually get into the space and start innovating. But what it's kind of evolved into is you know an excellent way to for for various startups to collaborate right so I'm, I'm kind of achieving that goal to some degree unintentionally more on the on the commercial side you know we have lightning logistics which is our last mile logistics service provider um, it's pure play ev uh, and we are operating about a thousand vehicles now across four cities in india uh, and you know our customers include fairly large e-commerce players uh, people in grocery mom and pop as well as courier companies. And we continue to to, to source uh, vehicles which are pretty much completely off the shelf from various OEMs. And what we immediately realized was that the market is quite crowded when it comes to especially electric two-wheelers. And all of them have been kind of designed with the consumer use case in mind, mostly for daily commute. But there was nothing to really fill this gap of an electric vehicle which could withstand kind of the the day-to-day -day use case of a logistics vehicle, both from, you know, performance, durability, reliability perspective. And that's where, you know, our product development team comes in. We're we're looking to develop EV form factors for the logistics use case. Right, right. So yeah, I mean, in a way, I think you're solving all the problems at once, right? I mean, you're solving the supply problem and you're solving the, the demand problem as well with these use cases for logistics and, and stuff like that. I want you to take a step back and perhaps talk about the kind of problems that you like to solve, right? So, uh, you know, maybe a couple of years back or something, I mean, you could have done plenty of different things. Why do you zero in on EV and, and are there specific types of problems that you like to solve? I've always had a passion for automobiles. My, my background is in embedded systems. Uh, and I think for me, at least for me personally, it was, it was important for me to engage in something which had kind of a social impact angle as well. And that's kind of where EV and actually in the broader context, clean mobility came in, right? So it seemed, it seemed very appealing and I think Yes, I think inherently in all that we're doing, uh, I, I cannot claim that EV is 100% clean. It's not, but I'm, you know, it'll, it's going to get closer, right? And I think that's kind of the ethos that we're taking with, with everything that we're doing is that we're going to be as optimal as possible from a social responsibility perspective. And today that means uh, EVs today could mean a different technology, right? I think that people, I think that there's this label of Nisalio is an EV company, but we are a clean mobility company, right? And then there's the distinction, right? And I think, uh, you know, as, and the, the logistics use case is, is, is so interesting because what we've realized is that, especially in the, in the two-wheeler logistics space, the, the vehicle itself is, is as a tool for livelihood especially for uh, for that community for the in the gig economy right and that was also um, a very very appealing problem to try to solve you know how do we how do we create a vehicle that is seen as a real investment to generate revenue to support people and their livelihood and that's that's kind of what we're trying to 
trying to achieve while also being green with our product development company. Right. Any other emerging use cases on that front? I mean, so logistics is one thing with Lightning Logistics. Have you looked at, for example, let's say renting it out to the Olas of the world or uh, the Ubers of the world and so on? So I think, um, you know, with our product development company, we're looking at focusing on commercial use cases, right? Commercial meaning revenue generating tools is what we want to create. People transportation is something that there are a lot of players out there already. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of them are doing a great job at it. Uh, but commercial use case is really for where we want to kind of carve a niche out for ourselves. Um, you know, you asked about other use cases. I think, you know, from what I've realized, come to realize the gig economy is much larger than just logistics, right? It, there, there are plenty of other forms of gigs, right? And there are plenty, and there's plenty of people who are, who are self-employed and, and running around the city doing, you know, doing their job, right? So I think, uh, definitely there are many other use cases. Right. And, you know, how do you balance all of these different businesses? Because inherently, I feel like, you know, product development is very different from, you know, running a logistics business from running a fund, right? So how do you balance all of these? And how do you dabble with these different things? Well, it's a good question. I think I do, while I do have a good grasp on all the, the major things that are going on, I think two big things help me. One is delegation. And, you know, to some degree, I have to admit it comes pretty naturally to me. And so, and, but delegation does require surrounding yourself with people that you absolutely trust. So I think that's a caveat there. And I think the other thing is being able to rotate your focus. And when you choose to kind of switch your focus from one thing to another, it could be, you know, it, it could be that you're focused on, you know, one of the, or I could be focused on one of the entities for a week or two weeks or even a month and then I choose to switch but then the, the switch has to be very intentional so I think um, yeah rotating a focus delegation and surrounding yourself with people that you trust I think those are the those are probably the things that help me the most <laughs> right so a broader question right I mean how do you see the future of mobility I mean you know if you were to look into the crystal ball uh, what do you see five years ten years from now so I think clean mobility is playing a large role today, it's going to continue playing a large role. It will evolve. Today we're looking, we're talking about battery electrics, um, you know, tomorrow it could be, you know, hydrogen fuel cell, I think, and all of these are, are evolving to chemistries, right? Or evolving technologies rather. And I think propulsion will, will get cleaner. I think the next hurdle in that evolution of powertrain is going to be in battery recycling, which is, I predict is going to be a very large space and and also second life second life recycling you know i think i think both of those those areas are going to be huge in the next five to ten years and i think another big trend is is just um and this is this is across the board across beyond mobility as well it's just that the the availability of data and what you can do with that right and i think with production of electric vehicles the quantum and quality of data that you're getting from these vehicles are massively improved and that's largely due to the fact that uh, there are less mechanical components and everything is electrically, electronically actuated. And what you can do with that is quite fascinating. I think we're, we're already seeing just a simple thing like location tracking. I mean, you know, things that you can do for route optimization is, is, is quite impressive. And of course, moving towards autonomous. I think, you know, realistically speaking, the short to medium term, we can expect uh, level one and level two auton autonomy in, uh, in India in, in the short run. And I think the, you know, gathering that data from, from the vehicles that are running today is really, it's really going to set that trend. Yeah. I am really looking forward to a future where vehicles are programmable, right? I mean, you simply upgrade an OS and, or something of that sort, and you know, you're, you're driving something brand new <laughs> basically, right? You know, on another note, we are seeing this semiconductor shortage and, you know, we're seeing plenty of geopolitical tensions and so on and so forth, right? So how will some of these macro factors impact EV and mobility in general, clean mobility in general? See, I think as far as geopolitical tensions, I feel like only time will tell. I think, you know, some of the relationships that we have as far as India and, and other, the global community is concerned, I think uh, some of the, those relationships will be rewritten. Some of them will look different in, in the future. And it's really hard to tell what that will be. The business community obviously has to, has to adapt to that and adapt to that quickly. And as far as the semiconductor shortage, yes, I mean, you know, by and large, it was created by the pandemic and due to like excess, uh, due to excess demand. And I think, you know, it, it's, I mean, it's encouraging to see, I mean, globally speaking, you know, I think governments have realized the importance of this. 
I think, I believe yesterday in the State of the Union, I think they announced a new, in the US at least, they they, news, they, they announced a huge grant to, to manufacture semiconductors in the, in the US. And I think similarly, other governments are starting to realize that and kind of the importance to, to bring that um, to domestic soil. So it's it's just like anything else in the ecosystem. I think that there, there has been a realization now that that semiconductors are are very critical in the long run right and uh, and i think the the i i don't think anyone expected that the demand could spike so you know so sharply yeah. yeah yeah and you know finally this is a very exciting space right i mean you see a lot of uh, young entrepreneurs building in this space and having spent some time in this space you know what is what are those two or three things that people should watch out for and uh, should realize before you know building a solution in the in the whole EV or clean mobility space? I think there are a few things, right? I think I think the number one thing that I have to point out right, is that you know the valuations in the space are are at all time high, right? And I think that's going to sustain for some time. But I think ultimately creating value over valuation is going to uh, because at the end of the day, you know, this is this space. It requires a long incubation period, and I think people have to be in it for the long run and not just quick valuations and exits. Yeah, that's uh, a that's a thing I want to understand a little more on, right? Because it's not a it's not a typical tech startup like where okay. you're shipping bits and bytes. I mean, you, it's it's still atoms and molecules, right? I mean, you're actually yeah. shipping physical parts, and yeah. so the typical you know uh, fail fast, you know uh, break things kind of an approach uh, will not work here. Uh, right. So you have to be a lot more tempered, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think at the at the end of the day, you know, the the effect of uh, of doing something you know, really fast and not very thought through it, you know, it can have safety implications for the end user, yeah, right? Exactly. It, yeah. And I think, uh, you know, that there are laws and regulation in place to prevent that. And yes, it does mean that it's, it's more, uh, it's more work and it takes more time, but those are there for a reason. And I, I don't think people can ignore that safety is paramount, not just for the well-being of the end consumer, but also for, well, most importantly for the well-being of the end consumer, but also for the success of the company. Uh, reputation, especially in the you know, automobile spaces, is, is everything. It's, it, it, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly small community. <laughs> and the other thing is, uh, touching back on what I, was, uh, you know, what I was mentioning about collaboration, is that what I had seen at least um, in the last couple of years is that there are companies which have amazing competency, with, maybe with one specific area, one specific component. And because there was a lack of market for maybe that specific component, they've gone ahead and built an entire solution or a vehicle around it which may be suboptimal because you know a lot of that expertise to build a vehicle end to end does not lie in house so i i really feel that collaboration is key right you it, it's very difficult to build all those comp i mean unless un unless you are established oem right and they 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 are established they have plenty of capital they've been around for for a long time and they know how to do it but if if you're a startup you know it's you're working on something quite niche in this in this space i think it's important to realize that you can't do everything and that you need to collaborate and you should collaborate with people who can grow with you and by doing that you don't have to be alone in trying to create that market for yourself you you actually have others who can collaborate with you right yeah this has been a fascinating conversation uh, shreyas a lot of nuances that we've uncovered about uh, this particular space which is really exciting and uh, you know almost on a weekly basis we hear about updates and so on so uh, you know, before we kind of uh, end the podcast, uh, any books or podcasts that you would uh, recommend to our listeners? You know, to be honest, I do prefer other mediums to kind of absorb information. I, I watch a lot of documentaries and a lot of a lot of TV, so I, I'd be happy to recommend a few of those. Yeah, sure. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, so, uh, there are two docudramas which I recently watched, which I, I thought were very fascinating and also a little bit tragic, but you know, it's it is what it is. But it was, it was very fascinating. One was called Chernobyl. Uh, which is about the, the disaster in Chernobyl. And the other one was called Dopesick, uh, which is about the American opioid crisis. And both of them are uh, probably slightly fictionalized, but I do have some basis in th truth. In fact, I think Dopesick was based on a book, but excellent, excellent to watch. Yeah, there was this uh, movie that came out, I think, uh, what was it, a couple of years back, Hillbilly Elegy, I think it's called, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, that also focused on the same thing, the opioid yeah. crisis in uh, the, yeah. the US, right? Yeah, pretty tragic. Yeah. But, yeah. uh, well, uh, all right, Shreyas, thank you so much for being a part of the podcast. I really appreciate your time and look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Roshan. Thank you so much for having me.
Thank you so much for listening. If you liked this episode, then don't forget to subscribe to us on your favorite platform and share this episode with all of your fellow startup operators. Also follow the startup operator on LinkedIn and Twitter for more updates. Stay safe, take care and see you soon on a brand new episode of the startup operator.